Thank you for introducing yourself, uh, Wasi from Ethiopia. Oh, great. <clears throat> Philippines, UK, it's terrific. I'm gonna put my email. in the chat and I'll make sure to do that later too. <clears throat> Well, it's 1030. I think we should get started. Um, and um, I have a presentation I'm going to pull up. And then I will introduce our program. So as I said, if you would please um, you introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, whoops. Introduce yourselves in the chat and um, let us know who you are, where you're from, and um, any other information about you. Uh, if you have questions that come up, we will be trying to um, monitor the chat um, as well. So I am uh, Rebecca Davis, and I wanna welcome you to our program on Girls' Rights Are Human Rights, Empowering the Girl, Child, and Adolescents. And this is part of the NGO CSW 68 parallel event. Um, and I um, am a member of the Working Group on Girls and represent the International Association of Schools of Social Work. Um, and the program today is um, focused on building the capacity of social workers uh, to advance agency and give girls a voice uh, because we believe this is a key strategy for empowering the girl child to achieve SDGs three, four, and five. Of course, we also know that gender equality is uh, important for uh, reaching all 17 um, uh, SDGs. So um, I do want to recognize the International Association of Schools of Social Work um, that supported this program and also Rutgers University School of Social Work in uh, New Jersey, uh, where I teach. Um, I direct our global programs there, um, and so I want to, to welcome everybody. Our present, so first for the program, I'm gonna give an overview um, of uh, some of the work we're doing with um, uh, around curriculum development and around uh, social work education. And also our presenters include um, Diana, I'm gonna ask Diana and Virja, uh, who are both social work students, to introduce themselves. Um, and um, Sam Sluion, who is um, a professor and chair of United Methodist University in Liberia, and also a member of the National Board of Social Workers in Liberia. Um, I have a video presentations uh, by him and some of his uh, recently graduated students. So that's gonna be our program. Um, and Melissa Sherma, I will ask you also to um, introduce yourself, yourself as well. So um, Diana, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Dr. Davis, and thank you to everyone for coming up on this program today. Um, I am happy to present to you the work that we're doing at the UN, and uh, my name again is Diana. I am a student at the University of Connecticut, and I represent the International Association Schools of Social Work at the United Nations. I also work with the uh, Committee on the Working Group on Girls, which I'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. And I'm excited to be here today and to speak with you all today. So thank you. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Virja. I'm a MSW student at Rutgers, and I'm also a research assistant for Dr. Davis. Um, I'm really excited to share with you um, about caste apartheid in India and its impact on girls and education today. And thank you so much for being here today. I I'm, I'm welcome you all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Shermer. I am a um, I'm actually, I work at the Institute for Families at Rutgers University as a senior program coordinator for the fellows program. Um, but I also graduated from my MSW from Rutgers in 2020 under the guidance of Dr. Davis. And I am currently almost finished with my uh, master's in public health and I'm back interning with Dr. Davis to complete uh, my internship and my capstone with her as well. And so Melissa, her work uh, is a lot around with um, youth that have aged out, that have aged out of the foster care system. And many of these are girls that she's, uh, that she's working with. So welcome. Thank you. And then um, for the fi final part of the program, um, the reality is internet doesn't work well for everybody. So I have some video clips um, of students that are talking about uh, that recently graduated students in Liberia that are talking about some of their work um, so that we can also hear their um, their voices as well. So I will be playing those um, near the end of the program today. Okay, so just to give us a little... Um, background. So basically the, um, the objectives for today um, is to explore the, for me right now is to explore the literature on girls empowerment within the context of the SDGs and rights-based approaches to summarize the evidence that links social service workforce strengthening and achieving the global goals and then highlight, which is really the most important part, is really highlighting some of the grassroots approaches um, that are being done to empower girls uh, and youth, such as mentor-led safe space groups, services, and community engagement models. So just a little background. We have the largest adolescent and youth population in the world's history. 1.8 billion between the ages of 10 to 24, and they face unprecedented challenges. Um, about 1.2 billion are between the ages of 10 to 19. That makes up 16% of the world's population. Half of them are girls, and most live in low and middle income countries. But the reality is between 2003 and 2015, 1.6% of health and development assistance went to support adolescent programming. And this was in the middle of uh, triple threats of conflict, climate change, and COVID-19. So empowering girls really represents an unprecedented opportunity for global progress. Investing in girls, we know, yields many returns, including reductions in early pregnancy, increased earning power, and overall healthier families and communities. Girls' rights fall somewhere between the agendas of children's rights and women's rights. Um, they're codified in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, the the uh, 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which is the visionary agenda for the empowerment of women, does identify the rights of the girl child as critical to the full realization of women's rights in um, women's rights in human rights. But girls are rarely mentioned as a specific demographic in international law, and when they are the barriers are not completely um, reflected. So our hypothesis is investing in girls yields many returns, including reductions in early pregnancy, 
and increased earning power, especially when girls have access to uh, equal access to education. We know the challenges. Girls' reproductive and sexual rights are highly controversial. The girls' rights to education and to be free from violence have more acceptability for some countries, but not for everybody. Uh, so there's work to be done in that area. Policies and laws on what happens to a girl's body, um, whom to marry or who owns and inherits property are inconsistent. Um, so the, we, So there are challenges that we face uh, in terms of equal power relations for girls. The rights of girls are generally um, excuse me, are generally framed in the soft law, and this means they're framed in non-legally binding recommendations or guidelines as an extension of adult women's rights. So girls are viewed as little women. Many of the programs that aim to empower girls are not evidence-based. Some programs are just add-ons to women's programs. So women and girls, girls are kind of an addendum. Um, but we have new research that shows the extent to which international law overlooks girls' rights really renders girls invisible in many respects. Um, Empowerment of girls, if we're really going to empower girls, programming really needs to view girls as agents of change. So that's a rights-based approach, not just beneficiaries of health and social service programs. Um, so unless power differentials are targeted, programs can end up reinforcing the lack of power. So empowerment really requires a social transformation. As girls' voices are, voices are strengthened, they speak up and are heard, and this leads to greater participation. Girls' empowerment expands voice and choice by transforming these power relations. So girls have more control over their lives and more control over their futures. So this is our theory of change, which involves three interrelated processes and outcomes. So when we talk about empowerment, it needs to include these three areas. The power to, and that's the power to make decisions and to act. The power within is the intrinsic power. So my self-esteem, my dignity, my self-worth. And then the power with has to do with the relationships the shared, shared power, the collective action, the mutual support. So the principles of girls' empowerment means that girls gain critical consciousness when they can identify and they can question the inequalities and the power in their lives. Girls participate in improving their own status. They gain access to and control over the resources Empowerment as we know it really does require a systems change. So our change approach is really about curriculum design that is targeted at girls to strengthen the social service workforce. Now, the work I've been doing with the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance is really about um, strengthening the workforce so that it is well-planned, social workers and social service workers are trained and they are supported. And this really plays a critical role in um, the workforce really being able to effectively respond to situations of vulnerability and harm to children and families. So capacitating social workers with the knowledge and skill to work with a girl child is considered the key entry point for uh, global development and change. Now, this approach is also reflected in UNICEF's strategy for ad advancing the protection of children. So just briefly to show you the framework that the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance has developed, um, has these three components. So planning the workforce around the laws and policies and strategies 
developing the workforce is really where I work. And that is really developing curriculum, strengthening faculty, teaching methods in order to, to provide the services and empowerment opportunities for girls. Um, so that's kind of where we are, are focusing our efforts. So I just want to go, I'm going to dig down a little bit the curriculum now. Um, we have start, we have come up with seven modules. Um, the first module is really the overview introduction, looking at the uh, girls' equality seven, and the, the uh, SDGs. Module two is around trauma-informed theories of change for empowering the girl child. Module three focuses on gender-based violence. Module four focuses on reproductive rights, menstrual justice, and health, including child marriage. Module five focuses on education and the digital divide. Module six is around girls and climate change. Module seven is empowerment of the girl child. And I wanna take a little bit of a deeper look at this particular uh, module because this is the focus of our, um, of our session today. Um, so some of the evidence-based practices um, and this is just uh, four of them I'm going to focus on. We're, one is on girls groups, so girl-only groups to build supportive relationships, build girls' knowledge, skills, and self-efficacy. That's that power with. Um, and also to link girls and their families with help and uh, social services. Um, and, and one of the things we'll hear about today is some of the social workers uh, and students that are focused on kind of facilitation of these um, of these groups. Safe space. This is one of the key um, one of the key uh, areas um, is around having these places, these spaces. Uh, a lot of girls have talked about school being one of those spaces. And this is where they have time that they feel like they can heal they can learn, they can build their resi resilience. Another is mentors, and this is usually young women, 18 to 25, from the local community who have experienced similar challenges and are well-trained and prepared to be role models. So again, capacitating them to be uh, role models is what's important. And another one is really that all of these programs really need to be embedded in the local community with staff, parents, and community members that are fully uh, engaged. So digging a little deeper into one of the safe space programming for girls, um, some, of the, uh, some of the key factors, number one, they need to be intentionally designed and targeted to girls that are most marginalized. And these are often married girls, out of school, or living with disabilities. Uh, and I wanna stress the, dis the, the living with disabilities because this is a, a group that uh, is highly marginalized. Um, the, the meetings are planned, they're structured, they're regular, they're weekly, um, and they're with girls that have some similar characteristics, maybe in terms of age, urban, rural, um, but, but some, some kind of commonality that they can connect with. Learner-centered and highly interactional. Um, so there's a lot of participatory uh, activities and the mentors are the ones that are um, help build the skills. They're very involved with the girls. Uh, they instill critical thinking and are adequately trained and supported. Um, so that's my uh, kind of background piece on what we're working on in terms of the, um, the curriculum. And I want to um, thank you for, um, for this opportunity. I do want to add that education is a lifeline for girls. Men and boys are critical contributors, contributors or barriers to the empowerment of women and girls. And so men's attitudes matter. We want to we make that um, important point 
uh, that we do need to include, include men and boys in our um, initiatives. So thank you. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Diana to talk about her. And Diana will be graduating this year. So we wanna congratulate her on thank that you. as well. Thank you, Dr. Davis. I uh, will be sharing my screen. Can you guys see it or? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello again, everybody. My name can you, is Diana. Can you, can you put it in the um, presentation mode? If not, that's okay. I think we can see it. Oh, okay. I think I, I put it. Technology is always never know what's going to happen. Oh, down at the bottom, there's the two out arrows. Hold on. I think if you do that. Um, do you see it at the bottom? The, no. The, the arrows, you've got the page three to, of 17 and then. I don't see it. No. Okay. Okay. I apologize. We'll, 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 we'll manage. This is reality. <laughs> Um, okay, so I will be talking uh, the agenda today about the United Nations Women. I'll be talking about the Sustainable Development Goal 5, which talks about gender equality. And I'll be talking about the Working Group on Girls, which is the committee that I'm part with, that I take part um, in. And also talk about Teen Orientation, which is an event that the Working Group on Girls um, do every year. And this year it happened on March 10th, and I was on the planning committee for that. And I'll talk a little bit about the Commission on the Status of Women. And lastly, how all these tie up into social work. What can we social as social workers do on a micro and macro level to ensure that we empower girls and women? So the um, UN Women was created as part of a um, UN reform agenda in July 2010 by the United Nations General Assembly. It addresses issues of gender equality and women's empowerment. Its mandate was to be a dynamic and strong, a strong champion for women and girls, providing them with a powerful voice at the global, regional, and local levels. Uh, it's not going. Okay, oops, sorry. So the UN women has three major roles that they play. The first one is to support intergovernmental bodies, such as the Commission on the Status of Women, in their formulation of policies, global standards, and norms. The second role that they play is they help member states implement these standards, stand, standing ready to provide suitable technical and financial support to those countries that request it, and to forge effective partnerships with civil society. And lastly, they lead and coordinate the United Nations system's work on gender equality, as well as promote accountability, including through regular monitoring of system-wide progress. Now, the work that they do with youth and girls include advocacy. Um, they use intergovernmental pro processes to strengthen engagement. They amplify the girls' voice so that we can hear their needs. And lastly, they mobilize, they do mobilization through effective outreach in underrepresented groups and minorities in different regions and thematic areas. Now for the sustainable goal five, as we know, the many countries around the world is still behind on the SDGs or the sustainable development goals for several reasons, including COVID, um, it is making a lot of countries behind on these goals. Um, the world is, try is, 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 is trying to achieve those goals by 2030. And goal number five talks about gen gender equality. It targets or that they want to end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. And they want to eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private sp uh, spheres, including trafficking, and sexual and other type of exploitations. 
um, oops, sorry. Now, 49 countries lack laws protecting women from sexual violence. Data shows from 87 countries that one in five women and girls experience physical and or sexual violence by the partner in the last 12 months. So we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Diana, can I just let you know your slides aren't advancing on the Oh, they're not. Oh, screen. Are you able to see it now? It's not advancing. Maybe if you stop sharing screen and you go okay. back. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. This is the reality of. <laughs> um, it tells me I click on it. Stop share. Okay. All right. Are you yeah. Okay. Try again to see if. It may be using Canva. It's not going <clears> to <throat> advance. Are you now? Are you able to no, no, uh-uh. Stop share. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so share screen again. Is that better? Yes, there it is. Yeah. Oh, great. Try to make it bigger. Are you seeing it now? I can see it, but I'm not sure it's going to advance. But you can you can try, yeah. Okay. And if not, we can hear you well. Okay. And uh, we can share the we can share the um, presentation later. Perfect. Thank you. So I am part of the working groups on girls. Um, it originated in the buildup to the, to the tremendous efforts made in 1995 in the ratification of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action as a global agenda for all the empowerment of all women and girls. Uh, the working group on girls emerged at the, as an NGO committee within UNICEF and eventually connected with UN women to grapple with the special needs of girls who have their own struggles of equality, education, and the right to be protected from oppression in any form. That work continues today within various WGG, which is the Working Group on Girls Committees, Standing Bodies, and Task Force. Each is led by a committee chair or co-chairs who together with uh, WGG member organizations work with and for girls at the United Nations. This strong network is established between the WGG and UN permanent missions, as well as UN funds and agencies. Provides the organizations with the scope and continuity of the most current UN issues, while in effective collaboration with civil society, keeps the working group on girls alive on the ground in countries around the world. And one of the program that the working group on girls uh, does every year is the teen orientation. The team's orientation purpose is to prepare girls and boys this year on this year's uh, 68 uh, year on the Commission on the Status of Women, which I'll explain what that is in a minute. It has three goals. It has the goal of talking about the priority theme, which is to accelerate the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls by addressing poverty and strengthening institutions and financing with a gender perspective. The review theme talks about social protection systems, access to public services, and sustainable infrastructure for gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. We teach these teens how to organize advocacy work. And lastly, this orientation helped build community and, and fellowship between and among diverse groups of teens worldwide. This year, the teen orientation happened on March 10th, 2024 in New York. And over 76 youth attended this year, including four boys. And, I'm, and I, I emphasize the boys because sometimes when we think of girls, we only focus on girls. But having the boys there give a different meaning to the, the, the teens' uh, purpose because the boys are able to ask questions, um, offer their thoughts, their ideas, and suggestions on how to better help girls and women. So there were girls from all over throughout the uh, the U.S. Some came from Denver, uh, uh, Denver, Colorado. 
Spokane, Washington. We had people from Cincinnati, Columbus, El Paso, Texas, South Florida, and uh, of course the Bronx. So it was very, very uh, interesting to see youths from all over the US came together for this teen orientation this year. So we had different sessions with the teens. Uh, the first sessions that we held with them was uh, to talk about what is advocacy, to get them thinking on how to do advocacy. So to them, when we ask them, what does advocacy means for you? Uh, a lot of them respond that to advocate is to raise your voice through stories. To advocate is to stand up for justice. Those are some of the answers that they, 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 they gave as to what is advocacy to them. The second sessions that we, we held with them was on the priority theme, which I just mentioned. And a lot of them um, mentioned that the, a lot of girls mentioned education is key in eradicating poverty. Education, um, educating the girl is vital to bringing change to society. Session three that we held with them was on the review themes regarding social protection. Um, Social, what does social protections mean to them? So to them, it, 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 it talks about creating rehab centers for women who have been trafficked, provides safe public transportation so girls can attend schools, and also provides scholarships for girls to attend schools. So those are some of the discussions that we, we have the girls think about what that means, social protection means, what does advancing, um, girls' uh, uh, gender equality met. And lastly, on the four sessions that we did, um, we did a mindful listening exercise where uh, we had the girls uh, uh, pair up and each of them had to listen to each other, but listening without judgment, listening to what they have going through without judgment so that we can better prepare and know what's really going on so that they can bring advocacy work forward. So it was a very... Um, interesting sessions to work with, with, with these teens from all over the US. Um, I'm sorry, my computer is just not advancing right now. I'm not sure why. Come on. Okay. Now the teen orientation, again, like I mentioned before, was to prepare the girls on the Commission on the Status of Women. So the Commission on the Status of Women is happening right now at the United Nations, and it started on March 11 until March 22nd. It, the sessions are supported and prepared by the United Nations Women. The Commission on the Status of Women, or CSW, was established by the Economic and Social Council on June 21st, 1946. Its purpose was to promote women's rights, document the reality of women's lives throughout the world, and shape global standards on gender equality and the empowerment of women. Now, how does it tie up as us as social workers? What can we do on a social level, uh, on the micro level, I'm sorry, and on the macro level to help girls' voice um, be heard? So on the, macro, on the micro level, we can work with local groups. We can listen to the community's specific needs and wants, not only listening to them, but also know what the community needs. So grassroots for voices are important. As social workers, we need to know what's going on on the ground, live with them, listen to them, to their needs, to what they have going on so that we can bring about change um, uh, for that community. On a macro level, which is on a bigger level, you can write to your local representative, legislators, Congress, to make the issues national news. You can keep, amend, or do away with existing policies for the betterment of the community. As Winnie Fred Doherty, a WGG member said, based on your own values, speak up. If you know there is an issue going on that is dear to your heart, that is valuable to your heart for women and girls to stop this inequality, speak up. That's the only way we can make changes on a micro level and on a macro level. Some of the resources that you can find, uh, the NGO CSW68 has an advocacy toolkit you can find on their website. You can also vi visit girlsrights.org. You can visit unwomen.org or the NGO slash CSW.org for further resources to help you with advocacy work to help end gender inequality. 
And thank you for listening to my presentation. And I hope you guys stay on to listen some more to the other presenters. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> I love I, I love your um your passion. And um, just to say there are not many social work students that have the opportunity to participate at your level. And so um, Dr. Healy, Lynn Healy, just to recognize is uh, your supervisor. Um, so I, I would like to recognize her. Hi, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Be proud. <laughs> So, um, Diana, one thing you might be able to do is just drop your um, your Canvas slides into the chat. So if anybody wanted to um, view them. Um, it will do. Thank yeah, you. That, that might be one. But, but that's fine. You, your voice came through, and that's what we wanted to listen to. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Virja, now we will hear from you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, once again, my name is Birja. My pronouns are they, she. Um, for anyone who's recently joining us, I'm going to be talking about um, caste apartheid in India and the effects on girls and education. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so <clears throat> uh, a lot of people don't know about caste apartheid, which is a form of oppression. So I'm going to be talking about what caste apartheid is and how this basically impacts people um, in girls in India, and specifically when it comes to their education. Um, so basically, what is caste apartheid? It is a system of um, social stratification that is ascribed at birth and it's arranged hierarch hierarchically. Um, we have Brahmins on top, uh, then Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras, and then all the way at the bottom, we have Dalits and Untouchables. This form of stratification um, is inherited and you're born into it. And it cannot be changed, um, whether it's, um, you know, through marriage or um, there's no lateral movement when it comes to caste system. Um, and it's based on your spiritual purity and the deeds of your past life. And usually you it's maintained, caste is maintained through marrying within one, one's own caste. And it's seen as a path towards redemption of your soul and because there is the concept of reincarnation that people believe in um, in India. It is one of the oldest structures of oppression in the world. Um, it's racial, economic, gender, political, and there is no biological or um, it has biological and spiritual basis. It's not factual. Um, as I said before, it also prevents class so uh, solidarity. Um, and now we're seeing with a lot of um, immigration that has happened um, across the world, not just in the U.S., um, specifically dominant caste people in the U.S. are using this narrative of um, being upper caste to separate themselves from Black, Brown, Indigenous people and to perpetuate harm in the form of anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity. Um, this caste system, if you belong to the lower caste, um, it's a life of servitude, humil humiliation, and exploitation. So the lower people who are considered um, caste oppressed, um, they are the Dalits and Adivasis, which I'm going to explain what the difference is and the similarity between these two groups. I also want to mention that people who are caste oppressed should have the choice in how they describe themselves, as not everyone will describe themselves as a Dalit or an Adivasi. Sometimes they use their religious affiliation. Sometimes they use a political term like Bahujan or subcaste. So what what does it mean to be a Dalit? 
Um, someone who's a Dalit, um, they are caste communities that were forced by caste apartheid into slave and bonded agricultural labor and undignified sanitation work like manual scavenging. Um, they were branded untouchable for jobs considered spiritually polluting, and they struggle against extreme violence, poverty, and discrimination. This is a, um, being cast oppressed means there is massive amount of social exclusion and also extremely laborious work. And then what is Adivasi? So Adivasis are the indigenous people of South Asia, and they are for self-determination, they are seeking political and cultural autonomy, and they are fighting against the stripping of their ancestral land and its natural resources. So what is the impact of caste? Um, one of the impacts, well, there are many impacts of caste, but um, some of the things are bonded labor. So India is the second largest producer of cotton, and a majority of those who are working in the cotton fields are Dalits and Adivasis who are bounded by debt slavery. 25% of these are children under 14, and 35% are children between 14 and 18. There's also a lack of access to schools, water, roads. Um, there are 37% Dalits who are living below poverty level and 54% Dalit children who are undernourished. Um, a lot of many of the Dalit children have to sit separately to eat in, a, in about 38% of government schools. So there is a level of segregation as well. Um, so how does the caste apartheid impact women and girls? Um, caste-based sexual violence is a huge issue, um, and it's a way to instill fear in challenging the system. More than 67% of Dalit women are survivors of caste-based sexual violence, and it's a way to dishonor and shame caste-oppressed women. Um, there's also, um, they're also tested to see if they're morally compromised or not. And this is actually an epidemic of gender-based violence um, within caste oppressed communities. And so not only are they uh, suffering from gender-based violence, but they're also suffering from generational trauma due to brahmanical supremacy. And brahmanical supremacy is basically um, the belief that Brahmins are at the top of this caste pyramid. Um, how is caste apartheid and gender um, uh, connected. So Brahmanical patriarchy is maintained through endogamy, so through marriage. Um, cisgender heterosexual relationships are seen to maintain caste purity, and caste honor is maintained through reproduction. So caste in school. Um, schooling can be a double-edged sword for Dalit children. Because schooling offers the possibility for emancipation and freedom, but it also can be a way of oppression because it perpetuates the physical and psychological violence by um, upper caste teachers and students, and this reproduces a lot of the caste structures, even within schools. Um, as far as lower, as far as caste, school, and gender. Um, a lot of the lower caste girls, they face double discrimination due to gender and caste. Um, many policymakers, they believe that um, the education attainment for lower caste girls is influenced by ignorance of the parents, cultural practices of early marriages, and they also attribute high enrollment at schools um, due to awareness campaigns. But the actual truth is, is that it's the persistence of lower caste parents and children to keep continuing to access quality education despite violence. And this is something that we're going to kind of talk about in one of the comprehensive interventions that was established in South India um, to kind of combat the low education attainment um, of girls in that area. Um, so it's good to have increasing education rates because that means that there is an overall decline in early marriage among girls. Um, this is very complex because there are casteist ideas for girls when it comes to purity and respectability. Um, for upper caste Indians, um, education usually improves um, marriage prospects um, for girls. Um, but when you look at lower caste girls, um, it reduces marriage prospects because they're often found to be overeducated compared to boys within their own caste. And 
like I had mentioned before, a lot of the way that caste is maintained is by marrying within your own caste. So a lot of upper caste people will probably not marry someone who comes from a lower caste. So one of the comprehensive intervention programs that was implemented in the rural, in two rural districts in North Karnataka, which is in South India, um, it was a Samatha program. Um, this involved 3,600 girls who were from ages 12 to 17 in about 119 villages and 69 schools. These were selected because it has high levels of poverty and there's a tradition of Devadasi sex work where girls, as soon as they hit the age of puberty, um, they're, they enter sex work. And the secondary school entry for lower caste girls is lowest in the state compared to high caste girls living in urban areas. The objective was to increase transferable skills and training of adolescent girls, um, to increase government um, school scholarships by families and adolescent girls, um, to increase gender equitable attitudes among girls, to reduce harassment by boys, and to facilitate a conducive school environment. Um, they were assessing the impact on these four different outcomes, which was the increase of entry into secondary school, the completion of secondary school, um, how many people were marrying before age 15 versus not, and then also how many were engaging in sex before 15. So this was delivered to all lower caste girls in the intervention villages for 36 months. That was the plan. Um, but what has happened is because of funding, um, a lot of it had to be cut short. They split up the intervention groups into two cohorts. The first cohort was um, the final term of the first year of secondary school. And they only received 18 months of intervention exposure because of funding issues. And then in the second cohort, it was the first term of secondary year, and they received about 30 months of intervention exposure. Some of the interventions included teacher training, safety plan developments, um, tracking to see which students were absent so that they can conduct outreach and figure out what was happening, mental health screening. So this intervention program was very comprehensive and there was other things that they were doing as well. There was a huge screening um, that happened before the um, intervention started and then after it was a it was a um, cross-sectional survey that was um, used as well as a lot of mental health screening procedures. So what we found in the program results is that the girls in the intervention group compared to the control group were significantly more likely to have increased uptake of skills and training, increased participation in extracurricular activities, and more gender equitable attitudes around marriage. Um, as we know, as we heard earlier in the presentation with Dr. Davis, like having safety places, having places where um, things like extracurricular activities can be a protective factor. Um, those who didn't get married or drop out, um, but they still were in the intervention group, um, they still had more gender equitable attitudes. Um, they had improved social networks. They had increased an in uptake of skills and training, and they, they had higher levels of self-efficacy -eff and activism. What we found is that in there was no difference in the uptake of education scholarships. And the reason this is, is because often um, there's a lack of awareness among um, families who are eligible and they're not sure, um, they're not made to aware of the economic incentives that are available to them. And this is something that um, the government has a responsibility to do to, for the people. Um, the other thing we didn't see a difference in was the school environment. Even though global education rates are improving, um, the quality of education is not improving. Um, and then also gender equitable attitudes around education. And this can be probably attributed to the fact that community level norms around preserving girls' sexual purity until marriage. Um, there was no difference in boy teasing. Um, this is due to the impact on girls' perceived honor and purity. There weren't many interventions surrounding um, 
you know, how how can this be addressed, um, the sexual harassment that girls face by boys, and as well as girls' mobility, um, the ability to move from um, the economic status that they're within and move up from that. So we have found that um, the Samata program also did a comprehensive mental health assessment and they did find that it is cyclical, the lower education rates. Um, a lot of girls, um, one of the main reasons that they found that they were not going to school is because of Eve harassment, which is basically sexual harassment by boys. And um, when sexual harassment by boys would happen, um, there was this need to protect the girl's purity and their honor, which is the only thing that is seen as lower caste girls can have. Um, and that is something, a valuable trait. So then they would be married young in order to protect that honor. And a lot of times they were not believed whenever they were told, telling people in their community or other people about how um, they were being harassed. And this led to loneliness, isolation, worry, um, difficulty concentrating, avoidant behaviors of like not going to school because they had fear of going to school and also just um, anger and frustration. What, what the program found was that there are certain protective factors like like having external interventions, extracurricular activities, which is something that the Samata program um, offered these girls. Um, with singing, dancing, playing, having um, other outlets um, that provided protective factors, and then also having the support system of family and friends who were looking out for them and believed them. It is very important that we talk about the end of the caste system. Um, this is not an isolated system of oppression that is only to India. This is also showing up in the US, in the UK, and a lot of other places in Nepal. Um, we're, there needs to be a deep acknowledgement from every single person of the caste wound in order for healing to happen, for there to be awareness, so that the healing can happen across political, economic, psychosocial, and spiritual realms. And also reclaiming consent as a part of healing, since such a big part of the caste oppression is gender-based violence and sexual violence. Um, also creating institutions that provide love and care for survivors of violence and for people to find kin, um, connection, because Brahmanical supremacy creates division and separateness. And to understand that caste oppressed people are deserving of joy, glory, power, life, love, all these things that are beautiful in life. And to also acknowledge the history of um, caste resistors in the past and present. And then also understanding how these systems of oppression are all interconnected, including black liberation and Dalit liberation. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation on girls in education and also just caste oppression in general. This is such an important topic that we need to talk about. I'm very passionate about it. Um, so thank you so much. And um, we can both drop our um, presentations in the uh, chat too, if you want to do that. I think that's helpful. Diana did that. If 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 um, you didn't see it, she put the link uh, for her presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I do want to add. I mean, I've learned a lot from Virja about cast um, this um, this year, um, and for our Council on Social Work Education, our um, the the standards that we have. Um, for 2022 have added caste as one of the uh, oppressive groups that we are um, that we are to attend to and, and to uh, identify in terms of power differentials, discrimination, et cetera. So this is something that we've been um, that's going to be very helpful to us um, and our um, DEI work as well. So maybe if I just, um, we just stop for a minute, uh, the next part of the program will be um, to, to hear the voices of some social works uh, recent uh, 
recently graduated social workers, just graduated this spring um, in uh, Liberia at United Methodist University. Uh, but before we do that, I just thought I'd check to see if there are any comments or questions that anybody has. There's some very, uh, also just to direct you to the chat for some resources too. Diana, there was a request for you to put in the resources that you listed at the end of your presentation into the chat. If you could possibly do that, that'd be great. Who, Virgil? Uh, Diana. Yes. Ah, Diana, okay. Yeah, and I will save, um, I will save the chat and go back through that. So if there's anything we miss, um, I will, I will re, I will respond. Uh, also, one of the things I learned that um, has related to the work I do relative to CAST is there's, um, I'm gonna put the link in the, in the chat. Um, it's the, it's, the Global Forum of Communities Discriminated on Work and Dissent. Um, and um, CAST is considered part of this. Um, and this is the language that the UN uses, which I was not familiar with. I do a lot of work in Eastern Europe. And um, so Roma is considered one of the the one of these categories. Um, so it's been very helpful to, um, to look at this from this particular perspective. So I do direct you if you've not come across this particular uh, website. Um, it's been very, very helpful. Okay, so uh, if there are no other comments or questions, um, so what I'm going to do now is, um, like I said earlier, because of the inconsistency of the internet, uh, my colleague in um, in uh, Liberia at the university, the United Methodist University uh, social work program, uh, suggested that we um, do a recording of the students. So I have just five brief uh, recordings, one of Professor Sluion introducing uh, himself, and then four of the recently graduated students. I sent them just a few questions in terms of what, um, let's see, I asked them, you know, what are some of your future hopes and dreams about being a social worker? Uh, what skills and values are key for your work? Um, and, um, so they're each just, a two minutes, um, two minutes each. Um, a few of them are a little bit hard to hear, but I just wanted to say, and I think this is representative of when we ask people to speak up, when we ask to hear their voice, uh, sometimes we might have to, uh, work at hearing it because of various, um, realities. Um, uh, so you might turn on your, um, the, the, um, um, the closed caption if, if you want. Um, but I think for the most part, uh, we, we listened to a few of them, Diana, and you said it seemed pretty clear to you. So, um, so first I'm going to show Professor Sluion, on and, um, and then I'll show, introduce the different, uh, students, um. Let me. Pull it up here. So. And I just to say, I know Professor Sluion, he lived and worked in uh, Philadelphia in human uh, services for 
a number of years and then went back to Liberia, his home, uh, to, um, to really build social work, really build social work there. Um, can you see this okay? Okay. Just a minute, let me be sure I check the share sound. Okay. Hello, my name is Professor Sam Slawian. I'm the chair of the Social Work Department at the United Methodist University in Liberia, West Africa. Today we will have some of our graduates who will be sharing with us some of their experiences during the time of their undergraduate studies and also of their practice in the field. Uh, this presentation is being done in support of the Rutgers University SAR event, which is taking place at the CSW at the United Nations in New York. So we listen and we listen to hear what our students have to say, or our graduates have to say. Thank you. Okay, so now I'll go to So the, the next one is um, the next one is Thompson Timmy Tope, and he's working on an initiative in, in his community to encourage young people to pursue education. I will say, as I listen to all of the students today, Diana, Virja, and these, I feel a lot of hope um, for our uh, for our future. I'm Thompson and Timmy Tull, graduate at the United Methodist University. I am a social worker by profession, and the group that I work with in my community has to do with youth. That is empowering youth that are vulnerable in community and not taking education serious and motivating them, telling them the importance of education that if they take hold to education and empower them in the future because they are the future leaders and my future expectation has to do with greater demand for service that is as population grows and societal issues become more complex there will likely be an increase in demand for social workers to address challenges such as mental health substance abuse aging and population and child welfare and what most I would like I would like to do as a social worker is to advocate and empower individuals, families within the communities in terms of capacity building that we enhance them. And in terms of skills and values for social workers in Liberia has to do with number one is civics. And within the service, I have a cultural competence. That is, we are of diverse diversity, and we are working with different groups in a different in a trap. So I would like to do that. And my skill has to do with a teamwork, building a team with strong teamwork, and also a community engagement and trauma counseling. It just gives me goosebumps when I hear them present and, and talk about their work. Um, I did put Sam Slewe on as the, as the professor, um, and I put uh, someone asked about his name. I wanted to so you see that. Okay, so the next one I have. Is Melissa. 
And she, um, she is um, working with a women's uh, girls group, women and girls group who have, um, are giving birth or have recently given birth. I'm Melissa Jule. I am a social worker from the United Methodist University with a bachelor degree in social work. 2024. I work with a group of women from the SDS 13 that are facing a lot of problems. And this group is called the New Breast Singing Group. We sing a shirt our problem with each other and at the end of the day we find solution for our problems. I came across a lady who was facing a marital issue and I gave her my pieces of advice and counsel her in getting her marriage back. My hope for her was to Reunite with her husband, and at the end of the day, she will tell with her husband and get a baby girl. What I want most as a social worker is to raise to raise an awareness and advocate for women empowerment or women protection. My skill and value was, or my skill and value and I to solve women problems in relationship and marriages. Advocate for women's rights in divorce process. My expectation is for social work to be recognized in Liberia and to be practiced in schools, hospital, Call from and even in the prison Thank you. One of the things we discuss in social work is uh, because we talk about how important it is to contextualize practice, um, but also being able to have kind of global standards. Um, and, um, uh, you know, having a global set of values, a, a global set of ethics. And I hear this coming through um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the methods in terms of teamwork, facilitation, uh, advocacy for women's rights, uh, this kind of common theme, but yet how we do it is where, you know, it's very localized and embedded in the community. So, I just wanted um, to point that out as we listen to the next um, that uh, I have just a couple of more here um, that I want to uh, want to share. And this is also great because we know the young uh, boys are out there, young men are out there too. Uh, this is John Carpenter, and he did his field practicum at a drug recovery program known as Destiny Recovery Program. And he was working with youth, young men and women between the ages of 15 and 30. Hello everyone, 
Joel Capital, a 2024 graduate of the United Methodist University in Liberia, and major general social work. Through my undergrad study, I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity or was opportune to go on internship at a field based institution, which is the Destiny Recovery Program run by Redeemed Church. And I work with young people between the ages 15 to 25 to a drugs addict. And I hope to, yeah, I hope, my hope is for them to be reintegrated into society and for them to recover 100% from that drugs addiction. And what I want most for them, what I want most as a social worker, I want to work with others, advocate to advocate for a strong just law in Liberia. And the skills and values in that in Liberia, for me, number one, the number one skill needed is trauma counseling because my focus was really on substance use and addiction. And the value is service, to provide service for my clients who are on Judge Recovery, Judge Recovery Program. And my future expectation about being a social worker is to rely on the core ethics to provide services, in providing services. Core ethics, providing services. Okay, and the last one, but not least, is Shia. Her name, she works with pregnant girls uh, and women in a community clinic. And the program is locally, they call it the Big Belly Project. Um, and so she's going to... present her story. Hello, my name is Yaya Tengwe. I'm a graduate of the United Methodist University with a bachelor's degree in social work. And my Work. I help pregnant women on on a facilitation of the group. Be better business is everybody business. We shall talk to them on how they can take care of themselves, how they can reach to the, the care center to get antenita. And my hope for them is to get a better health care center and for them to have a healthy baby. And my hope for them is to have a healthy baby. What are, what do you want most as a social worker? To help young girls with problems with their family and behavior in the community. To talk to them about themselves about how to take care of themselves, especially the teenager, to know their value as a teenager, and to become somebody in the society. My skill and values. My skill and value is social justice, inequality, and competence is my value. My skill is critical thinking, critical thinking, communication, advising, and listening. My expectation is, for the future is, for us to help our society, to help Liberia as a social worker to provide services to all facilities. Thanks. Okay.
I loved, I loved her thinking about the skills and critical thinking, uh, communication. Um, so that is our program. I, um, I don't know how many of you are in social work education out there, um, but um, it's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very inspiring to me. And I hope this has been inspiring uh, as well as informational to you. So let's open to see if there are questions. Um, Melissa, have there been questions in the chat so far that you, I know there's co comments. Um, yes, there is. Um... Just one about more regarding more information about your presentation, Dr. Davis. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. I don't remember where I saw it. Um, I think they just wanted more information about your presentation in general. Um about girls. Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, that was me. That's what I was saying. Yes, I um, found it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was just um I teach social work over in the UK in Sussex oh, um, and I, my research is girls, girlhood. Um, and I was really interested by the idea of having a particular module about girls and I'd really liked, well, they to pinch all your, all your work, Rebecca. Um, but I just, I'm really interested in that. And I'd be quite interested to hear about whether there was any resistance to that idea of having a module, particularly about girls from the organization or from the students or not so far. It's been very well received. We we haven't worked it through our committees and all that yet. Basically, I've had students that have been working with me um, over the last couple of years. So I have to give the students the credit on this. Um, I've used it kind of as a, a way to, to uh, raise, aware, raise their awareness of this particular area. So no, we haven't really haven't received any particular resistance to that. And I'm happy to, if you want to, you know, send your, uh, I can put my, uh, my slides in the chat. Um, and then, uh, because I have all the, the references and the different resources, Plan International, International, we use quite a bit of the information and tools from Plan International. Um, as well, so I'll I'll do that, and would love to get your your email. Thank you, Kiran. It's a hand up. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. I just wanted to say I absolutely loved this talk. I've loved how you've. Um, talked about women in India because that's where I work in the UK that's and connecting it back to India thank you so much Vija Vija sorry uh, I was drinking some tea before and to Rebecca for setting this up I've had such um I'll keep it short um I work with girls who are getting young girls and women having access to education because the illiteracy rate here in the UK is so high and English not being first language a lot of people a lot of young people are not in the education system and so they go missing I say missing because the government can't keep the figures of keeping these young girls into school in in the school system but also we don't talk a lot about um child marriages and it seems to be overlooked when it comes in the U when I work in the military uh, across the military and with universities child marriages are are up where young girls are going back to Pakistan in the cases that I've worked on. So thank you so much for an insight on your researches, your presentation, and speaking clearly, like making it very transparent without using, you know, confusing terminology. Most of the talks I go to um, have terminology that sometimes we can't relate to. So here in the UK, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, continuing to do, and raising awareness on important issues which affect girls all across the world. Thank you. It's very nice to, to, to be in touch. 
And if, yeah. always, if you want to put your emails in the, the chat, that would be terrific. And Melissa, I want to recognize you and appreciate your support <laughs> and help in this today. My pleasure. There are no other um, questions in the chat, but we, you know, we welcome more questions if anyone has any. Or comments or whatever. And I will go through the chat because uh give us email later. Okay. If there's no other comments or questions, Virja, mm -hmm. Diana, Melissa, either one of you wanna make any final comments? I just want to say this was a great opportunity for me to speak on behalf of the work that we do on girls. A lot of the topics sometimes, like we mentioned, are overlooked and they are very important um, to talk about. And we as social workers, we have a lot of work to do. We know that change doesn't come overnight, so we have to continue to fight and to make the change that we need we need to see. So keep fighting locally and then keep your voices let your voices be heard. Talk to your congressman. Talk to your local representative so that we can bring change around in the U.S. and hopefully nationally and internationally. So thank you. Thank you, Diana. I, You know, one of the things that I think that sometimes we overlook, and this is where the, the, the training of people working with youth, both boys and girls, uh, um across the the um the gender diverse uh paradigm the the um it, it's really about preparing people you know even for um for you know the teen orientation we want to have girls voices heard at the UN but they need to be prepared they need to be they need to understand how to do that who it is we're speaking to and that's the way I feel in in uh, social work as well. Um, that it's so very important to to be prepared to know how to facilitate, how to um, how to ask questions. And 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 thank you for your participation in the teen orientation. That was terrific. Thank you. Yes, it was a great experience to see young girls come together. And like I said, the, the boys too, we weren't expecting boys. And the fact that the boys were so engaged in the conversation showed that we, you know, they want to learn and they can make changes just as much as the girls can. So yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Virgil, do you have any any last words? Yeah, I just want to say um, thank you so much for giving me the platform to talk about caste apartheid. Um, it is a topic that I think a lot of people don't know about, and it's usually seen as something very isolated to India and Nepal and just more South Asian. And now with immigration, and that's been happening for many years, we're seeing how this system of oppression has um, kind of come to the US, the UK, so many other Australia, so many different places in the world. Um, and I hope that um, there were some takeaways of what caste apartheid is and how, you know, we can start creating awareness about this topic. I highly, I put a book in the chat, um, which is The Trauma of Caste. I highly, highly recommend everyone to read that. It does a beautiful job in connecting how caste apartheid shows up in westernized spaces and why we need to speak about it. So once again, thank you so much for being here and allowing me this opportunity to kind of shed light on the system of oppression. Thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. And I hope that you um, 
all have had a good uh, CSW experience so far and um, the rest of the last couple of days. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.